people were complaining about Tiger Woods and his affairs, and also about Arnold Schwarzenegger and his affairs. Many men aren't having the affairs of Tiger Woods. But that's not because they're good men, it's because they don't have a busload of Swedish bikini models waiting for them at the final hole. So the idea would be that you should conduct yourself so that you are attractive to many women, maybe that you have your pick of them, but then you should pick one. And that's a sacrifice. Obviously, that's a sacrifice of a sort. It's a strange sacrifice because, you know, I talked to someone, a comedian recently, who told me of one of his experiences in Las Vegas. So he went to Las Vegas with a sports superstar. And they went to a party and what literally happened at the party was one woman brought forward a small group of other women, all very attractive, and basically told the sports legend that he could just pick one of them and she would go home with him. And so that had all been arranged beforehand. And he said that he's been in many situations where something like that has happened. And I thought, well, you know, that sort of is appealing to the Hugh Hefner playboy 14 year old fantasy that sort of gripped our culture from the 1960s onward. But imagine that you sleep casually with a hundred women in a six month period or a three month period for that matter, or a three week period. I don't care. Pick your time frame. And you're ecstatic with yourself because you've been validated by this opportunity and I'm not making light of that. It's not nothing to be attractive to women like that. It's really something to be attractive to women like that. But it isn't obvious to me that your choice to conduct yourself in that manner enriches your life and the life of other people more in any way than picking one person and actually having a relationship with them. It's only true that promiscuous pathway, let's say, is better if you can actually divorce sexuality from all the other elements of life. Say, well, it's about variety and it's about impulsive pleasure. Or maybe it could be even slightly deeper than merely impulsive pleasure. It could be shared impulsive pleasure. But I don't think you can do that because sexuality isn't divorceable from family and from morality and from all the other elements of your life. And if you're mature, you know that. And so you make a decision. You make a decision not to capitalize on your opportunity, not to misuse your opportunities. It's pretty clear anthropologically as well that, you know, sexual choice tends towards a Pareto distribution, especially for men. So most men have very little selection at their disposal. And a small number of men have excess opportunities. The question is, what should that small number of men do? And you might say, capitalize on it then to hell with the consequences. And like, it's a powerful argument, but I do believe it's wrong. It destabilizes the society. And I also don't think it does your soul any good because the problem with treating other people as casual sexual partners, let's say, is that you also treat yourself that way simultaneously. And I don't think that does you any good because you're not, unless that's what you want to be. If you want to be a casual partner, well, I wouldn't say that's a particularly noble ambition. You should be able to do better than that. One of the things that enables long-term cooperation, peaceful cooperation between people is trust. I would also say that trust is the fundamental natural resource. If you have a relationship with someone, it's predicated on trust. And part of the reason for that is that trust is what enables us to look at each other without running away screaming. And what I mean by that is that if I trust you, then I don't have to take into account how complicated you are because you're horribly complicated. As long as you'll do what you say you'll do, then I can take you at your word and your word simplifies you and you can take me at my word and my word simplifies you and then we can act like we understand each other even though we don't. And so all of you, I suspect, have been betrayed one way or another. And so what happens if you're in a relationship with someone and you trust them, then you make certain assumptions about the past and you make certain assumptions about the present and you make certain assumptions about the future and everything's stable and so you're standing on solid ground and the chaos, it's like you're standing on thin ice. The chaos is hidden, the, the shark beneath the waves isn't there, you're, you're safe, you're in the lifeboat. But then if the person betrays you, like if you're in an intimate relationship and the person has an affair and you find out about it, then you think one moment you're one place, right? You're where everything is secure 
because you've predicated your perception of the world on the axiom of trust, and the next second, really, the next second, you're in a completely different place. And not only is that place different right now, the place you were years ago is different, and the place you're gonna be in the future years hence is different. And so all of that certainty, that strange certainty that you inhabit can collapse into incredible complexity. And you say, well, if someone betrays you, you think, well, okay, who were you? Because you weren't who I thought you were, and I thought I knew you, but I didn't know you at all. And I never knew you, and so all the things we did together, those weren't the things that I thought were happening. Something else was happening, and you're someone else, and that means I'm someone else because I thought I knew what was going on, and clearly I don't. I'm some sort of blind sucker, or, or the victim of a psychopath, or someone who's so naive that they can barely live, and I don't understand anything about human beings, and I don't understand anything about myself, and I have no idea where I am now. I thought I was at home, but I'm not. I'm in a house, and it's full of strangers, and I don't know what I'm going to do tomorrow, or next week, or next year. It's like all of that certainty, that habitable certainty, collapses right back into the potential from which it emerged. And that's a terrifying thing. That's a journey to the underworld from a mythological perspective. And that is really something worth knowing. Because, you know, journeys to the underworld are extraordinarily common in mythological stories. And, you know, like the Hobbit going out to find the smog, the dragon, and, and get the gold is a journey into the underworld. And journeys to the underworld happen all the time. And modern people don't understand what the underworld is, except that we've all been there. And we go there all the time. And we go there every time the solidity and stability of the world that we've erected, at least partly through our speech, is shattered because, well, some sort of snake appears. That's another way of thinking about it, and it's a really good way of thinking about it because, you know, no matter how carefully you construct the little habitable area that's around you, there's always something you didn't take into account, and there's always something that can pop up its head and do you in.